and I'm the head of neuropsychology here at Hogue Hospital, the Pickup Family Sciences Institute for Neuroscience Health. Let's dive in today as we talk about memory. So I'll ask that my dear colleagues here get the slides up on the screen as we get going. As we dive in, what we'll talk today about is overall brain health and wellness. We'll talk first about cognitive health. What we mean by cognitive health is your cognitive functioning. That's your ability to think, learn, and recall information. And cognitive health is really a continuum, a spectrum. So as we talk about this concept of cognitive health, we're thinking one end of the spectrum being your optimal functioning, say maybe how you were when you were age 25, all the way to the severe disability, meaning real impairments or difficulty with your day-to-day -day thinking and memory. And then all of the space in between is where we'll cover today. So as we age, there are normal changes in our thinking and our memory that are a part of the aging process. We've, we, of course, all age. No one has figured out yet how to defy aging. We're working on it in rat models, but we're not quite there yet. And there's a natural increase in your wisdom and expertise those sage elders in our, in our lives who give us phenomenal advice and input. So there's many benefits as we age to our overall thinking and memory. But of course, there is some natural slowing in our speed of processing, our ability to make decisions, and our recall or our ability to remember may slow as well. That's all normal part of aging. But cognitive impairment, or what we'll talk about today in terms of mild cognitive impairment and dementia, are not a foregone conclusion associated with aging. So let's talk first about mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, as you may have heard of. What we mean when we talk about MCI is the in-between stage of cognitive decline between that normal aging on one end of the spectrum and that severe impairment, or dementia more range, on the other end of the spectrum. We, in turn, mean that there's changes or difficulty with your day-to-day -day cognitive processes, but those changes are not severe enough to impact your daily life activities. Things like managing your checkbook, for example, your finances overall, your medication, your schedule. You're still able, generally, to do most of those things. Perhaps it takes you a bit longer or you need a little extra support, but overall there's no impairment requiring other folks to get involved or to step in. Folks with mild cognitive impairment are at increased risk for going on to develop Alzheimer's or other dementias. However, just because someone has been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment does not mean that they'll necessarily go on to develop dementia. Mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, can be caused by some external factors. Things like vitamin B deficiencies, depression, poor sleep, and sometimes when we treat those conditions, those underlying conditions, we can actually see an improvement in one's cognitive functioning so that they no longer meet criteria for a cognitive diagnosis. So just because you have mild cognitive impairment does not mean you'll go on to develop dementia. And in fact, some causes of mild cognitive impairment are indeed reversible with the proper treatment. First part of that, of course, is a full workup to diagnose what might be going on. And we'll talk more about that together in our time today. So as we then look at the progression or the spectrum of our cognitive health, on one side we have normal. Following that, there's this mild cognitive impairment range. Next up, we talk about the dementias. So mild dementia, more moderate, and then more severe. And as you'll see across time and across stages, the impact on our day-to-day -day life and functioning becomes greater and greater as the severity of the dementia process increases. So let's talk next about dementia. So, dementia means that there's an impairment in our overall cognitive functioning, that thinking and remembering and problem-solving ability that's severe enough to interfere with our day-to-day -day life, meaning you may need additional supports from loved ones or professionals, other accountants or caregivers to help manage your medications, for example. And it's not a normal part of the aging spectrum. So this is beyond or off what we would expect for normal aging. Oftentimes, dementia is progressive in nature. And whether or not dementia is progressive depends on what the cause, or the fancy word here, etiology of that dementia is. And dementia is an umbrella term. In fact, there are over 200 different causes or etiologies of dementia. So let's look here. As we said, 
Dementia is the umbrella term, meaning impairment in cognitive functioning objectively compared to one's peer group, and difficulty with day-to-day -day tasks, like managing finances, schedule, driving perhaps. As we look at the causes then, we see that the majority, the most infamous and most prevalent cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease dementia. In fact, our best estimates currently are around 70 to 80% of all of the dementia processes are due to Alzheimer's disease. When we look at the most prevalent causes after Alzheimer's, you'll see that Lewy body dementia and vascular dementia are tied for that kind of position. More recently, our research has suggested that vascular is a little higher than Lewy body dementia. Vascular dementia means that as we age, it gets harder and harder for our hearts to pump enough blood and oxygen to our brain. So we can see stenosis or narrowing of the blood vessels that run through our neck, both in the front and the back here. And as there's that stenosis or narrowing of the blood vessel, our parts of our brain, our key parts of our brain, are not getting enough oxygen and nutrients through the blood. Over time, then, we can see changes to what's called the white matter deep within our brain. And that's essentially responsible for a lot of the processing that we do day to day, kind of the highway of the brain. And so those changes from that chronic vascular uh, percolations in terms of the flow or uh, the amount of oxygen we're getting at a point in time, then we can see this damage over many several years or decades of the impact. And in fact, for most of us as we enter our seventh decade, very few of us have made it that far without some degree of white matter change due to a vascular cause. So of course, there's those chronic vascular etiologies. There also can be acute or sudden vascular etiologies like a stroke. So you may have heard of an ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke, different types of bleeds in the brain that can damage more focal areas or circumscribed areas. And someone can also have a more chronic vascular etiology as well. Outside of the vascular dementia etiology, the other most common type is frontotemporal dementia. Best estimates are closer to 5 to 8% of all the dementias fall under that category. And those can impact various different types of our functioning. Perhaps behavior, most predominantly, in our behavioral variant. Language, most commonly, in what's called primary progressive aphasia. We can also see motor variants as well that disproportionately impact our motor functioning. Then there are other types of dementias as well. Due to Parkinson's disease dementia, not all folks who have Parkinson's will go on to develop cognitive changes. But in a subset of the folks with Parkinson's, we do see those cognitive changes. Also, similarly, Huntington's disease, dementia, and of course, then mixed etiologies, meaning contributions for what's going on etiologically for multiple causes. So as we look at these various causes of dementia, the overarching similarity between these different etiologies is that at the core, there's damage to the brain cells from either a disease or a trauma process, meaning perhaps a motor vehicle accident or a stroke, for example, anything that might be traumatic to the brain. There can, of course, then, as we look at these various causes or etiologies, there's a contribution from your genetic and family history. So for many of those who, who have a family member who's had a dementia process, we're at increased risk for developing a dementia ourselves. There are some key genetic markers, both in the research realm that are being studied at that level, and also now commercially available as well, that can be helpful for determining one's risk. Now, just because you have genetic markers that increase your risk does not mean it's a sure thing that you're going to develop the dementia process. So if you maybe were warned in the past that you carry one of those genetic markers, I just want to remind folks that it's a whole multitude of factors that impacts our risk for developing dementia. And as we've done research, we think that there are likely thousands of different factors that contribute to our risk, many of which are lifestyle related. So of course, all the things that will make me very popular today, things like good diet, good exercise, stress management, being very proactive about your emotional health throughout your midlife has a direct impact on your risk for developing dementia down the road. So yes, the thing you did in your 30s, unfortunately, directly then impacts your risk for developing dementia years down the road. So taking care of yourself, even into your 50s and 60s, again, directly impacts that risk. 
And then, of course, your medical history. So folks with more comorbidities, meaning other disease processes, increase their risk. For example, we know that diabetes is a huge risk factor for developing cognitive change, as is high cholesterol that's unmanaged, sleep apnea as well that's unmanaged. So we always encourage folks to be very proactive about making sure they've got a thorough assessment of their health and are doing everything within their power to manage those health conditions as early as possible. Let's talk a bit more specifically about some of the risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease. Greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's is actually age. So unfortunately, after we hit 65, our risk for Alzheimer's doubles every five years. So once we hit the age of 85, our risk is about one in three. 33% of 85-year-olds, if we were to take a look inside of their brain, would have pathology or the hallmarks associated with Alzheimer's disease. Those are the tau fibrillary tangles and the beta amyloid plaques. As mentioned, family history and genetics is one significant risk factor. We've been able to study that quite, um, quite prolifically, specifically in Alzheimer's disease. So we know some of the genetic markers for Alzheimer's type dementia. As mentioned as well, those lifestyle factors are quite significant. So sleep, exercise, diet, stress management, and managing our mood symptoms, symptoms of depression and anxiety. We know, for example, that folks that have midlife depression and anxiety who do not undergo treatment actually have a much higher risk than of developing Alzheimer's disease later in life. So another plug to just be proactive about your whole health and wellness, which is inclusive of your mental health. Mental health is health. I also want to highlight that there's a correlation between race and ethnicity. So unfortunately, folks who come from a Latino background are 1.5 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And folks who are from an African-American background or heritage are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And we're doing quite a bit of research in the realm of other race and ethnicity related risk factors now to get a better understanding of it. In terms of vascular dementia risk factors, so again, age is one of those other key risk factors also in our vascular conditions. As I mentioned, as we age, most of us have some wear and tear across time related to just the, the day in and day out blood flow and some of the changes or variability in those areas. But there are other conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, that do increase our risk for other vascular related dementias and changes. Diabetes, as mentioned as well, particularly when it's poorly controlled. So folks that have been diagnosed with diabetes and are not taking medications or managing it through dietary approaches or a hybrid of both, both rather, are at an increased risk for developing vascular related change. Further, smoking history. So if anyone needs a nudge, smoking history is directly linked to our vascular health overall. And of course, anything that's bad for our heart is also bad for our brain. So same wear and tear that we see from smoking in terms of our cardiovascular health also then impacts our cerebrovascular health, meaning heart and brain circuit. Sedentary lifestyle is also a key risk factor for your vascular dementia. So very important to be active throughout the day. Get up, get moving, really schedule your life around making sure that you're active throughout as much as possible of your day. And then also a history of prior cerebrovascular events. So if someone's had a heart attack, a stroke, or what's called a TIA, or a transient ischemic attack, we do see an increased risk then for additional vascular events. Let's talk now about early signs of cognitive decline. So you might see early changes in terms of your memory. This is what we most commonly hear in our clinics here. This might look like forgetting a medication dose or difficulty recalling details of a recent conversation, particularly if that conversation was with your wife. I hope there's a few elbows out there right now, right? No, but again, it might be subtle, right? So it might be uh, easily dismissed as part of the normal aging spectrum, but I'll encourage you all to be vigilant for those changes and to watch to see if there's any, anything that you've noticed that's just beyond what it was previously, might be concerning in terms of your day-to-day -day life. We also can see changes very early on in language. So most commonly, this looks like word finding difficulty. The example I'll often use is that folks might have difficulty recalling the name of that one actor who was in that movie with Meryl Streep. What was that called again? Right, so a few of you have had that experience. But it might be more concerning when you're having difficulty finding the word for a commonly used household object. So saying 
spatula when you really mean butter knife, for example. Also, that's a great example of our misnaming, right? Calling something that some calling an item something that's closely related, but not quite what you mean. Where's the dog, rather than properly saying where's the cat? We can also see changes in terms of processing speed. So this means how quickly we take in information in the moment, make use of it, and give it back in a meaningful way. So you might still be able to complete tasks, for example, keeping an Excel doc with all of your household expenses on it, but it might take you quite a bit more time to complete that. We'll also see this with uh, other technology-related tasks. So, for example, if you're writing an email, it might take you two or three times longer to write that email, to find the words that you want to say, put your thoughts together, when it would have been an email that you could have previously written in 15 minutes and sent off. We can also see changes in terms of one's ability to pay attention. So this will particularly show up as difficulty tracking conversations, if the family's together, or you're in a group of people, or perhaps the plot line of a movie. So I'll often ask folks if they've noticed that their loved one has had difficulty following a play that they're watching or a movie plot line, particularly if it's not an action movie, right? Those are pretty easy to follow. But something with a few characters and a few folks you've got to track across a season or the length of the movie. We also look at executive functioning. So this is our higher level, higher order tasks. Planning, sequencing, functioning at that higher, higher kind of octane level. And so the example we'll often see here is that someone might have difficulty coordinating a party. So especially if they really love to host and were always the ones who hosted Christmas at their house, we might see that there's some changes in their ability to get together the guest list, organize the meals, coordinate who's going to bring what task, or I'm sorry, what, what items rather. That might be more difficult for them to put that all together. Similarly, for folks that were really interested in cooking, we might see more difficulty getting all of the items out hot at the same time. And for perhaps some of my gentlemen that are interested in home improvement uh, projects or ladies out there as well, I always ask, how many trips did you have to make to the hardware, this, hardware store this time? Right? Maybe you need to go five times rather than normally having to go just twice. And my question is always, is this a change? Is this the same as it would have been five years ago, for example? So how do we monitor for cognitive changes in ourselves and in our loved ones? Well, I always encourage folks to be really candid with family and friends, to, to feel comfortable sharing with them if they notice changes. So again, staying hypervigilant with the people around you and inviting them, particularly if you have a family history or concerns about cognitive changes, to give you honest feedback. The challenge about many of these neurodegenerative disease processes is that there is a change in insight. So we're not always able to see those changes accurately within our own life, but oftentimes our loved ones around us will say, gosh, you know, I did notice a few changes a few years back. I just thought they were getting older, right? I thought mom was getting a little older, dad was getting a little older. And I always encourage families to be really proactive. So if you're not sure, it's so much better to get a workup and an assessment done so you know where you're at now. And then of course, if needed, we can monitor across time for those changes. One option to do that here at Hogue is the Orange County Vital Brain Program. This is a brief cognitive screen. So we do a comprehensive interview, a memory measure, and then feedback right then and there afterwards, and also provide necessary referrals based on your performance. We encourage folks to come and see us after 45, age 45, if they have a family history, or after age 55 if there's no family history. But we welcome folks of all ages who might want to monitor their cognitive health across time. It's a really great way to get some objective data outside of what your life says or outside of what your son says or that loved one in your life. Just getting some objective data that can help you then make some decisions and track across time. So what do we do if we note cognitive changes? Well, our first line of business is to talk to your primary care provider. You'll want to work with your primary care provider to rule out any of these reversible causes, thinking in terms of acute medical causes like an infection, for example. So UTIs or urinary tract infections can have direct impact on our cognitive functioning. Of course, we know from the research now that COVID-19 infections can also have a direct impact on our cognitive functioning as well. So all types of infections can impact our thinking and memory. 
We want to rule that out that it's not due to a flu or another cause, either acutely, meaning in the moment is you're actively sick, or longer term, meaning that there's been some changes related to that illness. We'll also want to look for endocrinological causes. So things like we said, high, any kind of off levels with your thyroid, your B12, your vitamin D, making sure that those key markers are right where we'd expect so that we're able to monitor if there might be any impact from your metabolic functioning. We also want to consider medication effects. So unfortunately, there's a number of medications out there that do have a negative deleterious impact on key neurotransmitters that we use in memory. We call those anticholinergic medications. And so some of those medications are antidepressants. Some of them are helpful in terms of our bladder control. So there are many routinely used medications that your providers may not be thinking of in terms of the cognitive health impact. And so we'll often look at medications to make sure that there's not a reversible cause from a medication side effect that might be contributing to what we're seeing. This one will also not make me very popular, but certainly hearing difficulties. So unfortunately, the part of our brain, our auditory processing cortex, that's what processes any auditory input into our brain. And it happens to be right next to our memory center of our brain, co-located in our mesial temporal lobe, key part of our brain that processes memory as well. So we do know from the research that unfortunately folks who have hearing difficulties, who do not get it treated, do have a much more uh, rapid shrinkage, fancy word here is atrophy, or death of the cells or loss of the cells in that same brain region. So folks with hearing difficulties who don't get it treated have faster shrinkage of their memory centers as well. So very important to look at and rule out any contribution from a hearing difficulty. Obviously, you cannot remember what you cannot hear, right? So that's low-hanging fruit for us to get rid of in terms of potential causes. And then on top of that, we want to make sure that we're not seeing any long-term negative effects from shrinkage of that part of the brain. We also want to rule out any kind of contribution from poor sleep. So we do know that folks that have uh, un uh, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, fragmented sleep throughout the night, have much less quality sleep in terms of the neurorestorative processes. So we've learned in the last 20 years that sleep is really non-negotiable, and poor sleep is implicated in just about every disease process and disorder process, mental health to cancer to neurodegenerative diseases. So making sure your sleep hygiene and your quality of sleep are on point is very important. And then of course we can see a direct impact on our mood in terms of when, what the impact is on our cognitive functioning. So folks that are actively experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety, we also see declines then in their cognitive functioning or can see, I should say, declines in cognitive functioning as well. So we'll wanna rule out any contribution there. As mentioned, next steps for monitoring it. Always an option to get a brief cognitive assessment, like what we offer at OC Vital Brain. And then from there, and from working with your primary care provider, you can also receive appropriate referrals to a neurologist for a specialty workup, perhaps a psychiatrist to address any emotional difficulties or behavioral changes, or perhaps even a psychotherapist, again, to help work through some of those depressive and anxious symptoms. Lots more folks are experiencing mental health challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic and other life stressors in our current political social climate. So we always encourage folks to reach out early and get a little extra support and some more tools to help through the day. So what can you do now to reduce your risk? All right, so I hope you've got a pad and paper. Very important, like we said, to proactively manage chronic health conditions. Talk to your doctor about health changes. Make sure you're getting those medication interventions early. Make sure you're doing all of the things that they encourage you to do in terms of your preventative health care and chronic disease management. Also, as we talked about, get your sleep in check. If needed, it might be worth investing some time and energy to go see a sleep medicine provider to make sure that your sleep is getting at the highest quality and quantity possible. Of course, good diet, right? So our brains are very calorie hungry. They use a lot of calories. Not all calories are created equal. So I encourage you to check out other programming here on our YouTube channel about great dietary switches you can make to optimize your diet and brain health overall. Physical exercise, so very important. What we know from the research is staying physically active, 
cognitively active and socially active can help to preserve our cognitive functioning as we age. So those are three areas. Again, they're exercise or physical activity, cognitive engagement, meaning any kind of novel problem solving that you enjoy. That can be learning a new language, practicing a musical instrument, practicing new recipes, learning a new skill, anything that gets your brain going. And then social engagement. So staying really connected in your communities, with your family. All of the FaceTiming and Zoom calls count. It's just important that you have folks around you to reach out to and to make sure you've got that social support. And then finally, management of those mood difficulties and stress. So again, using tools, whether it be meditation, calm apps, or similar type apps to help walk you through that, or reaching out for any kind of emotional health support. Before we move on to questions, I'll just highlight here again, this is the Orange County Vital Brain Program right here at Hogue. The website is www.ocbrain.org, or phone number here on the screen is area code 949-764-6288. We'd be happy to see you for a baseline assessment, see how things are going, or perhaps you've seen us before, feel free to come back and we'll get a look at how things are going today. I'll just highlight a few resources before we answer questions. Two great organizations here in Orange County. The Southern California Council on Aging exists to support all kinds of older adults, those with cognitive health issues and those without. Phenomenal starting point for all kinds of resources, insurance counseling, respite care, legal guidance and counseling, everything you might think of. So I've included their information there. And also the Orange County Alzheimer's Association. They support families with all kinds of memory-related changes, not just individuals and their loved ones who've had Alzheimer's-related changes. So they're a phenomenal starting point. The phone number on the bottom of the page there in blue is staffed by a 24-hour-a-day licensed clinical social worker who can help to answer any questions as issues may come up. All right, so I've got some questions here. Bear with me as I get them. Can thyroid issues cause dementia? So certainly changes in your thyroid functioning can impact your overall cognitive functioning as well. We do see that folks that have hypothyroidism, for example, who get it treated though, don't have any long-term negative cognitive side effects. So very important, as long as it's well treated, your risk in terms of impact cognitively is quite a bit lower. So make sure you're really proactively managing your thyroid care with your endocrinologist or with your primary care provider, whoever's managing that. Is long COVID contributory factor for age-related dementia? Great question. So short answer is we don't know fully the extent of everything yet, though we don't, do know that there's a significant impact from COVID. So it's not always equal. Not everyone who's had COVID will have long-term cognitive impact. That said, we can certainly see that for folks who have had some emerging cognitive changes, COVID is a bit of gas on the fire. So it causes a neuroinflammatory cascade on a cellular or neuronal level within the brain that can, again, exacerbate or magnify some of those cognitive difficulties. We do also see new onset for folks that are healthy and well. We can see new onset cognitive difficulties related to that same uh, neuro cascade. Would a brain bleed be considered an issue later? So I, I'm assuming that you mean maybe a smaller bleed like a TIA or a, a Kuhner infarct, might, which shows up as a small, tiny bleed on imaging. Certainly that can be a risk factor. Again, it's all directly correlated with how well you're managing the condition that caused the bleed. So I really strongly encourage folks to work proactively with a neurologist or their primary care provider to make sure that they're on top of all of their health in those issues. It'll be very helpful and very important. All right, I think we did it. So we made it through all the questions. Thanks so much for joining me, and I hope you all have a lovely evening. Bye now.